old-fashioned Delmarva family camp meeting. Second full week of July every year. We're thankful for the Zugs and the great help they are to the meeting. And we have a motto right on the bottom here. If you like it hot, you'll like it here. Yeah. Amen. And you can take that any way you want to take it. Temperature-wise, heat-wise, weather-wise, or preaching-wise. And uh, we want you to pray for that meeting also. Uh, we have uh, planned this meeting for this year. We have about 30 preachers. It's the most preaching. It's the most singing. It's the longest duration of any of the camp meetings, a, a full week. And then pray for the Pennsylvania camp meeting. We're a part of that. And also the uh, Ohio uh, camp meeting. I speak on uh, Monday nights of uh, that meeting. And also there's a new camp meeting we're participating in this year right near the Indiana-Illinois line near Danville, Illinois, mm. as well as the revival meetings. And so when the Lord said, go preach, that's exactly what he meant. Amen. Thank the Lord. Amen. Brother, if you'll just fold that up a little bit and, All right. and give that back to God who he is and I'll forget it uh, if you uh, don't. Well, the Lord is on His throne, isn't He, folks? Amen. Amen. Is this my water? Brother? That's yours. That's, that's right. <laughs> All right, I wouldn't want to get in the wrong water. I'm allowed to break out singing. <laughs> and you wouldn't like you wouldn't like what you heard if you heard me uh, breaking out uh, singing. Why, well, it's exciting out here on the evangelistic trail. It's exciting to be a Christian. Amen. It's wonderful to serve the Lord. When I saw that, uh, map there of the world going around Africa, India, Asia I thought you know in spite of everything I'm thankful when it came across the United States of America I'm glad that's where I live Amen. I'm thankful for this country I'm thankful for other countries I'm thankful for the ones that will go to other countries and preach and evangelize but who would ever have thought that America would have played such a great part in uh, the evangelization of the world you know, we're in the line of Abraham and the prophets. It's the New Testament church. It's the New Testament church. The New Testament church is where it's at in the line of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. And from America, that great restoration movement was born and the gospel was sent and fanned out across the world in a world of Romanism, Islamism, and Buddhism, and every other kind of ism. We're just ism to death in this world. What we need is Christism. Well, it's not Christism. It's just Christ and New Testament Christianity is what we need. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Bless your heart. I was invited this uh, past year to speak for a seniors rally in uh, Zanesville, Ohio. I was called and invited to go up there and preach and I knew what I was going to preach. I knew I was going to preach the word, but I didn't know exactly how I wanted to come at it. And I was talking to a friend, and I said, you know, I'm preaching there for that seniors rally at Zanesville, seniors of a large part of the state of Ohio, and I'm just trying to figure out what to preach. Well, uh, Kenny, guess what they said I should preach? They said preach the gospel. And I thought, well, nothing better could be preached than simply to preach the gospel. And tonight, for a few minutes, I want you to share with me, and we're going to Revelation uh, chapter 14 and begin reading with uh, verse 1 and deal with the subject of the gospel of Christ. I'm thankful for the gospel. I'm thankful for the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Why buildings and all of this stuff is just window dressing. It's the gospel. It's what Kenny was talking about a while ago. We can have equipment and we can have this and we can have that. We can have chairs, we can have pews, we can have carpets. But all of that really is nothing. It's Christ. Christ is everything in the kingdom and the word and preaching of the gospel. And we need to concentrate on what we would have to take into a cave. If a time of persecution came, we could go in there with a Bible and we could go in there with our voices and we could praise God. We could take the Lord's Supper in there. We could do without a lot of this stuff. I believe we're getting stuff to death today. And we need more emphasis on Christ and the gospel than stuff. Amen. And I want to say praise God. It's good we have a lot of this good stuff. We can use it for the glory of God. But we need to realize that the primary thing is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The main thing is the main thing. And the main thing is Christ and His gospel. Amen. Amen. Want to deal with the subject of the gospel of Christ. Let's read from Revelation chapter 14, the beginning with verse 1. The Bible says,
says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. Of course, that would be Jesus. And with him 144,000, having their father's name written in their foreheads. We've read in the Bible where that 144,000 represented saved from the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 tribes, 12,000 from each tribe. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. God loves music. God loves music. Harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne. And before the four beasts, some translate that creatures, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. God has a special blessing just for the redeemed. Just for the redeemed. Guess who's going to heaven? The redeemed. Amen. The ones that are saved are the redeemed ones. They're the blessed ones. And the Lord is coming back after them and only them. The Bible says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. This is the verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of water. Look at verse 6 again. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the everlasting gospel, no end to it, the everlasting gospel, the effects of the gospel are everlasting. When you give your life to Christ and obey the gospel, the effects of that decision will last forever if you're faithful. The Bible says, Be thou faithful unto death. And that angel had the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Amen. When it comes to the gospel and the preaching of the gospel, my mind goes back to the early part of the New Testament, back to the book of Mark, uh, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. These are verses that you have been quoted and been quoting for many, many, many years. And as we preach the gospel, as we preach the gospel, Randy, we preach it because Jesus said so. Yeah. That's enough. Jesus said it. That settles it. No back talk to Jesus. We don't back talk to God. When God tells us something, we don't back talk Him. When we are told what to do, we're supposed to do it. How many of you had parents that did not allow any back talking? Well, we not only were not allowed to back talk, we were not allowed to look like we were thinking about back talking. Or we'd be out the back door. I'm telling you the truth. And my friends, you don't back talk God. You don't second talk God. If God tells you what to do to be saved, you don't back talk Him. If He tells you how to be baptized, you don't talk back to God. It's ask God. If He tells you how to observe the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day every first day of the week, you don't make excuses and talk back to God. And so when Jesus said preach the gospel, that's what He meant. That's what is to be done. And that settles the whole thing. The argument is settled before it ever gets started. Right. In Mark 16, 15 and 16, here's what Jesus said to His disciples. We mentioned this this morning. This is unbelievable. Here were men that were homeboys and barely been out of town and the Lord was going to send them across continental borders around the world. He was going to send these boys that were homeboys that had not been out of town hardly. They are going to send them to the far reaches of the earth and they were going to give their lives for the cause of Christ. All of one of, but one of them died the death of a martyr. Well, before his ascension, before we get into what it says in Acts 1, in Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world. Are you sending us into all the world? Here's what it says. Go ye into all the world. Go ye into all the world. He said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't say, Go ye into all the world and preach the doctrine of your choice. He didn't say, Go into all the world and preach the church of your choice. He didn't say, Go into all the world and preach what... Ever feels good in your heart to preach because everybody's going to be eventually saved. He was very specific. He was very exclusive. He said, go into all the world and he told them what to do. Preach the gospel. That wasn't the gospel of your choice, but the one gospel. The one gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Amen. Found here on the pages of the word of God. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Jesus said, here you have to be baptized to be saved. Jesus said, here you have to believe to be saved. He that believeth and is baptized.
baptized shall be saved. But he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And when it comes to the gospel of Christ, we preach it simply because Jesus said so. I remember a man by the name of M.S. Kitchen back in the 1950s visited the Ocean View Church of Christ, my home church. I was just a, a young boy on a tractor seat. And I could uh, drive an 8N Ford with my eyes closed, work the hydraulic and hook up the three-point hitch and everything. Dad had uh, taught me how, I, he put me on a log wagon when I was about five or six years of age to drive a pair of mules. I remember I drove a log wagon down to Fenwick Island. When I got there, pulled off the road, one of the wheels fell off. But back there, when you were five, six, or seven years of age, you did something besides pick out toys in uh, Walmart. And I believe a lot of these kids, instead of giving them toys, we ought to teach them how to use a hoe or an axe or a rake or a pair of pitchforks. Yeah. I heard one time there was a girl getting ready to go out on a date. And she was another generation. And her dad looked at her and said, Honey, you are a saint. Look at those uh, jeans you got on. They got holes all in them. Well, Dad, that's the way they do it today. Look at those shoes. They've got holes in the toes. Well, that's, that's the way they do it, his daughter said. He said, you look a sight. You can't go out like that. Your hair looks like a mop. She said, what's a mop? And I think that is one of the problems. Today, people just don't know some of the basic things. But here it's exciting to hear Jesus say, preach the gospel. But MS Kitchen came to my home church. And uh, he challenged this boy to come off of a tractor seat and go get ready to preach the gospel. My, I already had a 41-acre farm. My grandfather bought it for me and bought me a new tractor and, and plows, discs, and cultivators. And uh, I was paying on the tractor and he, I still owed him for the farm. It only cost $1,550. cost a fortune today. But he said, you can just go ahead and pay me, but pay for the tractor first. And I thought I had it made in the shade with lemonade. I was going to be a farmer. And I had a new Massa Harris twin uh, cylinder with a red seal continental engine in it. Uh, Massa Harris. My, it was a beautiful brand new tractor. And I thought, my, the world's, I've got the world on the table. But I'm telling you, that man came to our home church and said, we need boys to preach the gospel. And it touched me. It hit me in the heart. And I went and I made the decision to go preach the gospel. Why? Because Jesus said so. Not because M.S. Kitchen said so, but because M.S. Kitchen said, Jesus said, go preach the gospel and we need preachers to preach the gospel here in the East. And we need preachers to preach the gospel around the world. Right. And so Jesus said, go preach the gospel. And when we come to the gospel of Christ, we preach it because Jesus said so. Amen. Then I found another verse about the gospel over in the book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse 16. We preach the gospel... Number one, not only because Jesus said so, but we're to preach it unashamed, unashamedly. We're not to be ashamed of the gospel. You know, there's people that are starting to be ashamed of the gospel. They're starting to be ashamed of the church of Christ. They're starting to be ashamed of the Christian church. They're starting to be ashamed of the Lord's Supper of the Lord's Day. Ashamed to tell somebody that they have to be baptized to be saved. Ashamed to tell somebody there's only one church. They say, you claim you're the only one saved? Absolutely not. On the radio program, when I tell them there's one way, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, I'm, I tell them, I'm not asking you to come to me. Because if you came to me, you wouldn't be any better off. What I'm saying is, let's all of us just get rid of all of these isms and denominationalism, Protestantism, Romanism, every other kind of ism, and let's take the Bible only, go back to, and let's unite together and restore the one church, the one body. Let's just be Christians only, having no headquarters but heaven. Amen. No book but the Bible. No name but the divine. Amen. Shake hands with somebody homelier than Brother Randy here while I get a drink of this food. <laughs> Brother, did you ever put your foot in your mouth, Brother Randy? I was uh, in Ohio several years ago to a revival meeting. Forgot the exact name of the church uh, right now. But I pulled that one. There was a man and his wife... Uh, sitting right down here. They hadn't been married long. He'd lost his wife. And a year or two later, he found another fine lady, a Christian lady, and they got married. And uh, Tom Postal was his name. And I was in a big way, wanting a nice laugh from the congregation to kind of limber up the congregation. I said, uh, shake hands now as I get a drink of water. Shake hands with somebody uglier than Tom Postal. <laughs> his wife came up and shook hands with me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes... <laughs> You put your foot in uh, your mouth. But the Apostle Paul said 
In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, he said, For I am not what? Ashamed. ashamed. Say that. I am not. Ashamed. Let's say it again. Ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He wasn't ashamed of the one church, the one faith, the one baptism, the one everything else. He wasn't ashamed of God's way, which is the only way. Jesus is not a way, he's the way. He's not a hope, he's the hope. He's not a savior, he's the savior. He's not one of many multiple choice. He's the one and only. There's no salvation. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4. Amen. And verse 12. Number 3. There's an additional passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16. The gospel of Christ is to be preached with absolute necessity. I have a New Testament home that's called New Testament in 26 translations. And I love to examine these alternate uh, translations. And in this passage, I want to read it first and then share some of these alternate translations. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 16. Paul said, though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. He said, I don't have any right to brag about preaching the gospel. It's my duty. One translation says there's no need of boasting. Another one says no cause of pride. CEV translation says there's no brag to it. Uh, another translation, Young's Little translation says there's no glorying to it. And so Paul didn't have anything to brag about. It was a privilege. It was a responsibility. He didn't deserve a gold star. He'll get a gold star someday. But it was his duty, his responsibility. Listen to this. In 1 Corinthians 9, 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. You know what one translation says? I'm doomed. He says, I'm doomed. Paul says, I am doomed if I preach not the gospel. I'm a dead man. I'm gone. I'm, I'm lost in hell if I preach not the gospel. I've been called. And the Bible teaches when you put your hand to the plow, you can't look back. Yeah. How many of you had anybody that's hated you for 50 years? All right. I had one in my own family. I didn't realize that they hated me. When I went through the mountains up near Boone, North Carolina, I would call them. I thought they loved me. The man loved me. He's my cousin. But I found out his wife had something against me and she hated me for it for about 50 years. I just found out about it just two or three years ago. It just was devastating. I prayed for her since then. Here's why she hated me. She took the telephone one time I called. And when she took the telephone from her husband, I heard my first cousin, her husband, say in the background, now be nice. He knew that something was coming, that she was going to blow me out of the water. And she called me names and told me things. It's a sight what she said. I couldn't believe it. Well, I loved her. And I loved her husband. I loved the family. And after 50 years still carrying that grudge, she said, do you know what you told my husband when he decided he was going to leave Bible college and go back home? Well, her husband had made a decision to preach the gospel. I'd forgotten this, but she reminded me of it, and I was glad that I said what I did say, although I should have said it to her. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. He was going to go back home and give up and do some other job. And for some reason, I had read the verse where it says, if a man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. How many of you have read that passage of Scripture? Have you read that passage of scripture? If you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. She said when he was ready to quit and leave, Raymond, that's what you said. That's what you said. He that uh, puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And she hated me for 50 years for telling her husband that. I should have told it to her. If I had any courage, I might have told it to her over the telephone. But I was as nice as I could be. And kind as I could be, and I've been trying to, to pray for her off and on ever since. But listen, the gospel is to be preached because Jesus said so. It's to be preached and we're not to be ashamed of it. And it's to be preached. Absolutely. Listen to this. It's to be preached out of absolute necessity. It's not a matter of choice. It's not a maybe choice. Friends, I've got to preach it. I've got to. I'm doomed if I don't preach the gospel. Someone says, how long are you going to preach, Ray? I said, well, as long as I can. And I don't know how long that's going to be. 
Uh, one of these days when I get old enough, I may retire and spend a few winters in Florida. I'm only 78. So maybe in five or six more years, I might slow down a little bit on our revival meeting. We've got about 35 to 40 engagements of this year. I'm not bragging. I'm saying give God the glory. But even if I did have to retire because of health or something, I still have the responsibility to share Christ to tell people about the Lord, to try to do what I can if I have a chance to talk to a waitress, talk to a waitress. And so the gospel of Christ is to be preached out of absolute necessity. It's not an on again, off again, maybe so, maybe no. You've got to do it. Paul said, I've got to do it. I'm doomed if I don't do it. Yea, woe is me, Paul said. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Some people say I'm a little bit embarrassed to share about Christ. We started home from a revival meeting a few years ago, two or three years ago. And I thought I'm going to talk to a few people on the way home. My wife and I like to stop. We stop and get a diet drink and a Twinkie every once in a while. And I stopped in to get a cup of coffee or something. I went in. Nobody was in the convenience store except myself and the lady that was behind the counter it was very early in the morning and I wondered what is a good question to ask someone you ask someone if they're a Christian why well, everybody and his brother will say yeah I'm a Christian so I found out I just can't get the job done by asking them if they're a Christian so I came up with another question to ask them I said have you been baptized for the remission of sins and then you can go from there faith and repentance and every other thing but that hits right down to the crook of the matter, and I said to her, only she and myself were in that room, and I said, have you been baptized for the mission of sin? She said, we don't discuss religion or politics in here. <laughs> well, I was very nice, went on, paid my bill, went on down the road, asked another person if they'd been baptized for the mission of sins. I said, no, I'm a Catholic. Went on down the road in, in Grantsville, Maryland, asked another one. I said to a young lady, there was an older lady standing there, I said, have you been baptized for the mission of your sins? She said, I don't have the least idea. And then we went across the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, stopped at a fine seafood restaurant there, looking out over the water and the boats, and we hadn't made up our minds what we wanted. At least I hadn't. There was a girl about 18 or 20 that was waiting on us, and she finally came back to the table. Well, I was all fired up being with people like you, people that love the Lord, people that love revival. And uh, she said, <laughs> she said, have you decided? Well, I couldn't help myself. I said, Yes. I've decided to follow Jesus. My, you could have bought her with two biscuits. I'm telling you, it's a wonderful thing to share about Jesus. You've got to love him. And I'm ashamed of myself. I don't tell more people. But you've got to tell people about Jesus. Not only is it a good idea, we must. We've been saved to save others. We've been saved to serve. We've got to figure out some kind of way, if it's nothing but a track or a pamphlet, some kind of way to share the gospel. Because Jesus said so, unashamed and also out of absolute necessity. Amen. Then a couple of other thoughts before I let you go. In the book of Galatians, we're going right through here now. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8, we're to preach the gospel without substitution. One thing America likes to say today is, what is your religion? Or what church you go to? Or what faith are you part of? We know there's only one church. That's not my church, your church. It's the Lord's church, the church based here on the Word of God. And uh, there's not many religions. It's just one religion. One religion will save. Whether, uh, whether it's a pope or the president or the pastor, the only way any of them can be saved is to not put their faith and trust in that man-made ways. They've got to put their faith and trust in God and obey the gospel. And we're not saying we're right and everybody else is wrong. We're saying we're all wrong until we go by the book. By the book. Amen. That way we can tell the people around about us about New Testament Christianity. In Galatians 1.8 we have an amazing thing. I want to start up here though in verse 6. Paul said, I marvel. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of God and to another gospel. I marvel that you're so soon removed. God is, I believe, marveling that people so soon remove themselves from the assembly. People so soon remove themselves from being present when they ought to be there, meeting around the Lord's table. So soon they remove themselves from prayer. So soon they come in the front door, go out the back door. My friends, the back door is not the way to heaven. Sticking with the Lord is the way to heaven. And the Bible says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you to the 
grace of God unto another gospel. He said, which is not another. Which is not another. And then he goes on and says, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel. We talk about perverts in California. We talk about perverts in Dewey Beach, Delaware. There were perverts in the Church of Christ before there ever was a Delaware or a San Francisco. Preachers, perverts, what's a pervert? I'm not talking about immorality. I'm talking about perverts, people that pervert the gospel. A preacher that preaches another gospel is a pervert. That's what the Bible says. That is a pervert from the standpoint of perverting the gospel. Then the Bible says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him. Then verse 7, which is not another gospel, but there be some that trouble you who would pervert the gospel. Kenny, if someone perverts the gospel, they're a pervert, aren't they? And so sometimes you don't have to look all the way to San Francisco to find them, do you? We need to think about it right here. We talk about San Francisco. We talk about Dewey Beach. Let me share something with you. I was reading in the Bible where the Lord went to the cities around about Palestine. And He went to the city of Capernaum and He preached to them and they rejected His message. He said it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the judgment day than for you. It will be more tolerable for the homosexuals and the lesbians on the day of judgment than for you because you've heard the gospel and you've not accepted it. So sometimes when we're pointing out there, we need to point in here and cast the beam out of our own eyes in order that we might be saved. You know the Bible says, such were some of you. How many of you have read that passage in Corinthians? The Lord Jesus Christ talked about it through Paul, the ones that were saved how that they were fornicators and adulterers and whoremongers and homosexual offenders, one translation says. You know what he says to the Corinthians? Such were some of you, but you've been washed. You've been sanctified. And the Lord can take away all sins. Amen. So we're not pointing a finger, we're preaching the gospel Amen. to a lost and to a dying world. But what comes up here is almost unbelievable. Verse 8, For though we are an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. Let me read that again. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8. Paul says, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. If an angel so bright you had to wear a set of sunglasses even to look at him. If an angel so bright comes into your home tonight and stands at the foot of your bed and brings another gospel other than this, let it be a curse. The Bible teaches the angels don't have any right to change it. Man doesn't have any right to change it. And I'm telling you, if the angels can't change it, the Protestant pastor and the Catholic Pope can't change it. If the angels can't change it, we can't change it. And we love everybody. We're not knocking anybody. We're just saying it's a dangerous thing to tamper with the gospel and try to change the word of God. So here he said, if an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel unto you than what you've heard and what we've preached, you let him be accursed. And then he repeats it. How many of you ever saw a ghost? Or talked to someone that believed in ghosts? We had a revival meeting down near Bluefield, West Virginia. Joe was just, oh, about so tall. And the preacher and his wife we're like Jonathan myself. It was just a little bit odd. And she claimed there was a spirit in that house that went around opening and closing doors. Well, when you got a little son there, about so tall, and the people where he's going to sleep that night talk about a spirit running around there opening and closing doors, his eyes get a little bigger every time he hears it. And uh, they said, yeah, that, that's a friendly spirit, though. It's a friendly spirit. Well, I didn't know about having some kind of a spirit wandering around in my bedroom. I had a seven-shot, 25 cold automatic that I kept under my pillow. But how do you shoot seven holes in a spirit? You just couldn't do it. And so we took it with a grain of salt. Joe came up from the basement where they put him, had to sleep with us. I guess he got thinking about that spirit. But friends, if a spirit... Any kind of a spirit, any kind of an angel, any kind of a celestial being, any being from above or below or in between comes and preaches any other thing. Let him be accursed. I read where the Bible not only says our God is a jealous God, but I read where it says 
Brother Randy, our God's name is jealous. God doesn't like to be too timed. He doesn't like for His Son to come down here and die on the cross and people get over here and try to change this, change that, and change the other. It's been sealed, set, sealed with the blood of Christ. Christ died, was buried, and arose again. And the angels can't change it. If they can't change it, Ray Bennett can. And I don't want to. I'm satisfied with it the way it is. We're going to close out here tonight. Ken, as we get ready here to sing our invitation. There's one more passage in closing I want to share with you. Over here in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1 and verse 10, we have something to add to our list. Number one, we preach the gospel because Jesus said so. Number two, we preach the gospel out of absolute necessity. We preach the gospel unashamed. We preach the gospel without substitution. And here we learn clearly in this passage that there's condemnation that comes to someone that does not obey the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible is very plain and very clear. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired of all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day.